So in this segment, we're going to be talking about this absolute clown, Daniel Hannan, saying that um, if the EU is stupid enough to retaliate over the Northern Ireland Protocol, it will be hurting itself. And obviously, the EU have to do something, because if they just let the UK get off scot-free, the EU are going to look very stupid. Um, and they're going to look like they can't enforce international agreements, which no country wants to be in a position where they look weak, because um, they'll get walked all over in international politics. That's what will happen. So Daniel Hannan coming in the 14th of May, saying we must refrain from unilateral action that would undermine our unity and our Western partnership against Russian aggression, said Robert Metzola, the new president of the European Parliament. And she was spot on, though not in the way she intended. OK, so he's agreeing with this person here, saying the um, we must um, refrain from unilateral actions and do uh, stop anything that would damage the Western alliance. Fine. O opening paragraph, not bad. So this was during a discussion um, in the uh, discussing discussion about the ongoing UK EU relationship in one of the forums. It was in the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. Um, you know, most of them, vigor, uh, most of the delegates nodded vigorously at her implied criticism of Boris Johnson, which you know is is fairly implied that she talks about unilateral action. It's about Boris Johnson. Um, Okay, fine, whatever. He wants to be weird. Let's let's start off with that. Yes, but the real danger to Western unity is not the careful removal of some pointless checks on goods moving within the United Kingdom, which isn't true. These checks aren't pointless. It's to stop goods leaking into the EU single market that haven't gone through the, st the right processes. Essentially blowing a hole in the EU single market and um, potentially vi violating WTO rules, um, most favourable nation status. He goes, it is the EU's determination to treat Britain as a wayward province rather than an ally. The thing is, though, if they did, if they wanted to treat us like a wayward province, they would have kept their legal action as they were entitled to do last year. But because they saw us as a friend or an ally, they decided to pause it because talks were still ongoing between Frost and Marisevkovic. So again, it's just a stupid point there from a stupid man. Um, there is a categorical difference between what the UK is proposing to do and what the EU is threatening in return. Obviously, we're threatening to scrap an international agreement. The EU are saying, OK, if you do that, these things will happen. You know, if, you're, if you get rid of the Northern Ireland Protocol, we can get rid of the trade and cooperation agreement. You know, it's not hard to figure that out. Is whatever your view of the protocol, no one seriously doubts that Liz Truss is trying to remedy identified problems. Is she, though? Because I don't think she is. You know, he talks about wanting to ease the flow of goods and um, to enable the return of power sharing. The thing is, right, it's not about, you know, for the DUP, it's not about easing the flow of goods. It's about scrapping the protocol in its entirety. That's what um, uh, Donaldson has said. It was unless the protocol is scrapped then the DUP won't return to Stormont. So it doesn't matter about all these green and red lanes, all the yellow lanes, the blue lanes, the purple lanes, the green lanes. It don't matter because that's not what the DUP are fussed about. They just want the protocol gone. It was while respecting the EU's concern about leakage across the border. And now I'm going to go back again to this article by Tony Connolly, where he talked about how the UK could have had the green lane, red lane system, the trusted trader scheme, but the UK... Uh, kept unilaterally extending this scheme to companies that were only established in Great Britain and changed various criteria so that more companies could avail to, uh, of the scheme than originally agreed. The UK was continuing to demand that the UK trader scheme be extended to all traders in GB. So all traders in GB would be called trusted traders. Again, it's just absolute stupidity from this man. So if this man actually did reading, you know, if he wasn't just some unelected bureaucrat, which he claims to hate, by the way, maybe he would have actually read that article from Tony Connolly before writing this trash. Um, you know, he says, she, in other words, is acting to alleviate the harm, not cause it. But if she wanted to alleviate harm, she would go back to these proposals set out by the EU and say, OK, let's start from there and figure out which companies can go on the trusted trader scheme and start from there. The same day, the same sadly is not true of our Brussels counterparts. When the EU freezes the UK up horizon, now I've spoken about that before. I don't necessarily agree with it so long as the UK is paid in uh, to the horizon scheme. If we haven't paid in, then you know we can't have an argument really about it. Um, but you know, if the UK has paid into the horizon scheme, if that was one of the things a part of the trade and cooperation agreement, we should be allowed to take part in it. If it wasn't part of the trade and cooperation agreement, then I think the EU can be can be um, annoying about this, but they can kick us out of horizon. When it drags its feet over the electricity changing arrangements that were supposed to come into effect last month, I'm not sure what he's talking about, about electricity trading arrangements. That one I'm a bit unsure about. Stalling the development of renewables in the North Sea. Now, that one, 
that one I'm guessing he's talking about the UK taking sorry the EU taking the UK to WTO over subsidies um, that I'm assuming he's talking about which the EU aren't stopping us developing renewables in the North Sea it's just about how the windmills are made and how we're sourcing the parts so again they're not stopping us they're saying hang on now under these agreements you can't do that they're holding us accountable to the rules you know it might be a bit rare for Tories to understand that being held accountable to the law etc you know especially given Partygate as such but um yeah and he goes um and prolonging Europe's dependence on Russian energy now you you can give a lot of criticisms to different uh, European leaders for allowing their countries to be so dependent on Russian gas and oil that's fine you know it's fair criticisms um, but the problem is you're going to cause a lot of internal problems if you just suddenly just turn off the switch of Russian gas um, and oil. It's going to cause problems. Um, this is where, you know, that international cooperation can come in and try and help Germany and the other countries kind of ease themselves off Russian energy. Which should, These are the conversations that should have been happening over the last couple of months, really. Um, but, you know, attacking, you know, attacking the EU over this is just stupid when the EU needs unanimity to act. Unanimity to act. So if the EU said, look, we're going to ban all Russian oil and gas, Germany could stop it. That's why that's one of the issues around the EU's approach. But, you know, you can't you can't create a system where member states don't have a say over things. Here's when it rejects mutual recognition for conformity uh, assessment on products. It makes everyone worse off, which to an extent, you know, it means that UK exports have to go through another regulatory burden. Um, but, you know, that's what EU single membership is. And we're going to have a separate story cut talking about how UK regulators are in the dark because they have no idea what they're doing. But, you know, when you want to export goods to a country, if they say, look, you have to adhere to our regulatory standards and everything is going to be checked according to those standards, then what, what can you argue at that point? You know, um, it, it's just stupid. Even if we have the same standards for political reasons, they can stop us exporting if they want to help their own exporters out. That's called being in the club and not being in the club, and we are not in the club. You might not like the plans to disapply the most burdensome aspects of the protocol. I mean, okay, but you know we're not just doing that though, are we? You know, last week they were talking about scrapping the protocol. This week it's fix it, don't nix it. You know, it's ridiculous. It was, but you can't seriously claim that it's motivated by an um, animosity. It is true, though, because, you know, during the vote for the Northern Ireland Protocol, you know, when they vo we voted to leave, etc., um, back in 20, I'm going to say 2020, um, the start of the year, when all the laws were passed, Boris Johnson apparently told people in the DUP and uh, people in the IG that he's going to scrap the protocol. So, you know, to argue it's not motivated by anim uh, animosity makes no sense, because it absolutely was. We had our fingers crossed behind our back. The EU, by contrast, talks openly of retaliation. What, what do you want to do? Do you want them to whisper it? It's like, I know what the UK is doing bad. We might retaliate. You know, are you stupid? Honestly, obviously they're going to openly talk about retaliation. We're openly talking about scrapping the protocol. Even off suspending parts of the trade agreement, actions that have no conceivable purpose beyond hurting Britain. That's the point, douchebag. We're doing something that's going to hurt the EU. We're putting a massive hole in their single market. What do you expect them to do? Sit down and do nothing. The colonial era, era of Britain has gone. We're no longer a superpower. We can't go around bullying countries, you fool. Obviously, that's going to happen. You know, if they're openly talking about retaliation, that's fine. We're openly talking about violating international law. You know, they're not the same. Please remind me again who's undermining our Western partnership against Russian aggression. Now, you know, buying Russian oil and gas doesn't, you know, it does undermine Ukraine. But do you know what also undermines Ukraine? Taking a lot of money from the Russians and not sanctioning them as quickly as we could have done. And also allegedly still taking money from the Russians via the back door. Those things also undermine the Western partnership against Russian aggression. But, you know, you do you, my friend. He goes, I won't itemise the full case against the Northern Ireland Protocol. On this page, it was an unequal treaty. <laughs> I thought I thought we were sovereign, you know, how are we still getting bullied by other countries and the EU when we're a sovereign country? You know, he is, I won't uh, itemise the full case against the protocol. I mean, didn't you guys support it, though? So what, what are you talking about? He goes, it was signed under duress when continuity remainers in Parliament or making it impossible for Britain to leave on better terms. Yeah, and here we go. We were told at the time it's a great deal. Um, they've looked under every rock and, you know, they found no issues with the deal. And then suddenly, suddenly, just like that, as soon as everything's done... You know, they're like, oh, there's a problem. There's a problem. You know, it's just like when, I think it was Susanna Reid 
asked Ian Duncan Smith the day after the referendum, so the NHS is going to get £350 million a week, right? And he goes, oh, no, we'll get the lion's share of it. It's like, hang on, though, the bus. So that that's exactly what these people do, you know. They'll lie. Once they get it through, then suddenly the thing they voted on, the thing that they got you to support, they're like, oh, it's a problem now. It's ridiculous. There's no one in Brussels had thought to propose anything so absurd until 2017 when their British uh, auxiliaries won a parliamentary majority. That's not what happened, though. The people who won the majority was the Conservative uh, uh, Party combined with the DUP. You know, it was a coalition government. So, again, it wasn't full of um, these were all voted in by the British people. So unless you've got a problem with British democracy, this, this point here in pink makes no sense. Um, the protocol is supposed to chafe. Um, it was designed to ensure that Britain suffered for leaving. No, it didn't, though, because you guys said it was a great deal. Do you not understand? Lord Frost said it was a great deal. Boris Johnson said it was a great deal. You guys consistently lied about it. Because if it's suddenly a concern, you either were lying or ignorant back then, or you're lying and ignorant now. It doesn't make sense. You know, Barnier was apparently caught on camera telling Eurocrats that the border has to be um, neutralised before trade talks uh, began less Ireland. So he's saying, Barnier said, we have to sort out the border problems with uh, Northern Ireland before we can start um, on a free trade agreement. I mean, that's not a scandal. You know, getting caught having parties in Downing Street and breaking the law, that's a scandal. You know, cheating on your wife when she had cancer, that's a scandal. This here, talking about sorting out the border problem uh, before sorting out a trade deal, it's not a scandal, mate. Honestly, it's not. You know, this trade equivalent between Britain and Northern Ireland is equivalent to 0.008% of the EU's GDP. Yeah, Brussels conducts around 20% of all its checks on this trade. Again, I, I don't know what, what he's talking about here. You know, conducts 20% of all its trade um, in the Irish Sea. That doesn't sound right, especially given how much the UK exports to the EU. Surely most of the checks that will be happening will be around third country. So, uh, I don't know, it's countries like Turkey, uh, Ukraine, um, Russia before the war. Um, the UK, when we export to France, to uh, the Netherlands, to, to other EU member states uh, directly. I mean, that 20% figure, I don't know where he's pulled that one from. Again, he doesn't cite any studies or any actual evidence. He, just, he feels like he just made it up. He goes, some of the current arrangements making people fill in forms to send parcels to another part of the UK, for example, or making them pay to take their pets with them are plainly meant to irritate. No, it's meant to make sure like your pets have the right vaccinations and injections to make sure that they're not going to carry diseases. Um, into the EU, for example, into Northern Ireland, for example. That's that's the point of them. You know, certain countries allow you, um, f you know, have uh, had vaccine mandates. They weren't designed to irritate people. They were designed to stop infection spreading. Come on, dude. You know, so what can Britain do about it? Apparently nothing, because we signed it under duress, but even though we're a sovereign state, even though we always were. He goes, the UK could simply say, we won't put up any infrastructure on our side of the border. What you choose to do on your side, uh, what you do on your side is your business. So what he's saying is, get rid of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And if, if the EU set up a border in the island of Ireland, which I don't think will happen, but if they do that, or if they have to, you know, if they set up a border there, they'll say, ah, oh, look, it's you. You're breaking the Good Friday Agreement. That's on you. You guys are in violation of international law. You sacrifice peace in Northern Ireland. That's what they're trying to do here. This is that argument here. You know, that's what you're trying to do in green there. But, you know, at the end of the day, the Americans have said we are, you know, by threatening the Northern Ireland Protocol, we are the ones threatening the Good Friday Agreement. The UK are the ones threatening the Good Friday Agreement, not the EU. So this argument won't hold sway in the International Court of Opinion. His trust is not proposing to scrap the protocol, but she was, though. So, again, that's a lie. But to alter parts so that it, meet, it meets its own stated goals of preserving the integrity of Britain's customs territory. But if we had the relevant IT system set up and everything else, we wouldn't be facing as many problems. She wants a green channel for goods whose destination is local, with checks applying only to those at risk crossing the border. And again, you know, we've covered this already so many times here. You know, if you want to read this article from Tony Connolly, you have to scroll fairly far down to find it, but it's there. We could have had this system in place, but the UK messed around with it. It's comical at this point. He was, she wants um, Northern Irish firms who do not export to be free to choose between British or EU standards, but it doesn't work because Northern Ireland is in the EU single market for goods. So how can they go to British standards for goods? It doesn't make sense. And even then, I don't think these manufacturers would do it, though, because it wouldn't make sense because they can export to the UK under the EU standards and export to the EU 
under the EU standards with no issues. So why would they go to British standards when if they try to export into the EU, if those goods get found, there'll be problems. Goes, so she's offering Brussels unprecedented real-time access to Britain's customs database. Where is it then? Where are these IT systems? Because they, you know, we, you've barely got the GVMS system up and running after what, like five months at issues back in April. So, you know, that the idea that we have live data I've seen nothing of the sort to actually say that we have or to show these systems working. It's ridiculous. At the same time, the foreign secretary wants to alter the um, absurdly lopsided deal whereby the EU gets to set some of Northern Ireland's taxes. Now, this is a bit where the UK probably will get somewhere on when it comes to VAT, etc. Um, because certain countries have low, very low uh, VAT, lower than the UK. So this is somewhere where maybe the EU can say, look, you can set the VAT rate. Um, but you can't set it below a certain number. Again, that would make sense, I think, in my opinion, anyways. And where the ultimate arbiter is the European Court of Justice rather than a neutral tribunal. And again, why was it in 2019 the ECJ was fine? Um, especially when there is an arbitration mechanism built in that would be independent. So, again, that point, mute point. As having spent a year suggesting practical reforms and getting nowhere, what practical reforms have you suggested, big man? Because the, the Green Lane one, it could have happened. The trusted trader scheme could have happened. But you guys decided to mess around and you found out. Britain now proposals to make change itself in a measured and sensitive way. No, it doesn't. Because we literally spoke about scrapping the protocol the other day. As Article 16 specifically uh, provides actions for one party. It goes... If the application of the protocol leads to serious economic, societal, or environmental difficulties that are liable to persist or to a diversion of trade, the Union um, of the United Kingdom may take unilateral, unilaterally take appropriate safeguards, but it has to be in a very limited way and it has to be time specific as well of how to solve those specific issues. You forgot to mention that bit of the protocol, didn't you, big man? Because economic difficulties, the protocol is adding perhaps £10 billion, the cost of goods crossing the Irish Sea. But again, it's allowing uh, Northern Ireland to import goods from around the EU single market and groceries um, on average are around £10, you know, total shopping. Um, according to the Cantar study that the DUP side, groceries are actually cheaper in Northern Ireland on average than they are in GB. So clearly Northern Ireland doing okay, buddy. Was the basis of the Belfast Agreement was the power sharing resting on joint consent. Um, but, you know, the point being is that Brexit wasn't done with cross-community consent. So how can you argue against the Northern Ireland Protocol and say it needs cross-community consent when the Northern Ireland Protocol is a byproduct of the Good Friday of Brexit? The fall in GB and Northern Ireland commerce is matched by a 50% increase in trade across the Irish border. So there you go. You know, <laughs> Northern Ireland aren't missing out. Northern Ireland getting goods from um, the Republic of Ireland. What's the issue? You know, unless unless they want specific British goods, which I doubt a lot of them do, what's the issue here? I don't get it. As Britain, in short, is on strong legal ground. Is it, though? You know, Braverman won't even publish her uh, legal basis on what the UK can do to suspend the protocol. She won't give the analysis. We've covered that. Um, she won't publish the legal advice around the protocol. So what is this strong legal ground we are stood on? And if we are, why are you scared about going to court then? Much stronger than certainly the EU was in January 2021 when they briefly invoked Article 16, but they didn't invoke it, did they? They didn't implement it. Someone in the commission said, oh, let's do it. And then someone else said, no, what are you doing? And the T-shirt called, made some phone calls and was like, sit the hell down. And, you know, those people in the commission did. Eurocrats hate being reminded of that decision because you keep... <laughs> Because you keep talking about things that didn't happen. That's why they didn't invoke Article 16. Because if they did, they would have to have border posts up. They would have to have stopped vaccinate, um, you know, vaccines going from uh, the Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland. They didn't, did they? Honestly, this man. You know, the EU might, in theory, uh, seek to scrap the entire trade deal with Britain. Um, but this would be a decision for the national leaders, most of whom Emmanuel Macron expected um, see as a see as demented to start a trade war with the EU's biggest customer. We're not the EU's biggest customer. Um, the Americans are, and the Chinese are. We're, we're not the EU's biggest uh, customer. It's not even clear that a trade war is the right term, since there would be no conceivable victory for the EU. There would be when we sit the hell down and. Um, Stop messing around with the protocol. That would be a victory, wouldn't it? Because the chief effect of putting tariffs on British goods would be to drive up prices in the EU. And that is that is a flaw with a trade war, that no one actually really wins a trade war, depending on what your strategic goals are. Obviously, the EU strategic goal is to stop the UK messing around with the protocol. But this will effectively kill exports from the UK to the EU. Now, 
of course it is going to drive up prices i don't know how much by you know will it be a one percent increase or whatever purely because the eu has other options when it comes to food there are lots of third country deals the eu has um, and also the EU single market is huge. You know, if they can't um, import shellfish from Britain, for example, they can buy it from Croatia. If they can't buy pork from Britain, for example, they can buy it from Denmark, etc. Stuff like that, really. The EU has options. Britain allows EU financial services uh, providers to operate here under their own regulations, but Brussels refuses to return the favour because they don't have to. Again, you know, they don't have to give equivalency to us. It's a political decision as well as an economic one. So this argument that, oh, the, you know, we've done this nice thing for Brussels, we've done it because these financial services make us so much money. That's why we've done it. We've not done this out of the goodness of our own heart. We've done this because these financial services make money. If we didn't do this, then UK, uh, sorry, EU traders would be kicked out of, you know, UK clearing houses and we'd lose out on billions potentially. Britain lets the EU nationals use its passport e-gates, but only the, the um, our oldest ally, Portugal, has reciprocated. But if that's not up to the EU, then is it? It's not, it's not up to the EU to make that decision. It, it's nation states that are allowed to tell us, are we allowed to use the electronic gates or not? Come on, dude, you just debunked yourself. As Britain led the EU satellite programme, but has been frozen out of it. We weren't frozen out of it. We chose to leave the Galileo programme and come up with a joke scheme in its replacement. Come on, dude. He goes, for example, we might not see a go slow by the French officials under a bilateral deal to operate at Dover. So... You know, he's talking about the customs officials at, in France taking their time. You know, it's up to them if they want to do that. Um, you know, if, if they want to take a croissant breaks, feel, fair, fair play to them. As, but consider the timing. Britain is doing most of the heavy lifting in assisting Ukraine. Is Brit that, That's the question I'm asking the audience. Is Britain actually doing most of the heavy lifting? Because when it comes to refugees, we're definitely not. So is Britain doing most of the heavy lifting here when it comes to sending arms, etc.? Or is it, you know, the Czech Republic? Is it uh, Poland? Is it the USA? You know, I, I, don't, I genuinely don't know. He goes, Macron has been keener on conciliating with Russia. You know, obviously he tried to go through talks with Russia. He tried very hard to do that. And in the end it failed. And, you know, you can't, you can't blame him for trying to talk Russia down of uh, economic suicide, really. Because that's what happened in the end. And also, obviously, um, a massive, uh, you know, poten potential war crimes in Ukraine as well. Let's not forget that they did invade a sovereign state. It is really um, conceivable that the EU would pick this moment to escalate its quarrels with the UK. But the thing is, the EU isn't escalating the quarrels. It's us. You know, you can't punch someone in the face. And when they go to hit back at you, say, oh, look, you're escalating this conflict. You know, someone has to start the conflict before it could be escalated. And that's what the UK are doing. He goes, it would limit trade with Britain while continuing to buy oil and gas from Russia. And obviously, that's a problem. But we're the ones breaking international agreements as well. Um, and the EU, for the most part, has sanctioned a lot of Russian oligarchs and sanctioned a lot more trade with Russia. The only problem is um, we have to go for green energy because this is showing you the problem with re relying on dictators and despot leaders for natural resources. It creates problems. And when you're dependent on them, they know it. They know they can get away with stuff. Look at Saudi Arabia and look at Russia, for example. They know we're reliant on their natural resources so they can get away with stuff. That's why. But um, anyways, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Support the channel on Patreon if you can. And hopefully I'll see you in the next one.